Can you kill the lights up here so maybe they can see that a little better up there? The two side ones. There you go. All right. Well, um, I'm really excited to be here today because I really believe the enemy did not want me to be here. And uh, I want to thank Chris for, for um, allowing me to see that. Right before the service, I was whining to Matt because uh, I missed my flight on the way back and spent an extra almost $900 in order to be here, which makes me sick. And the thing is, is that where my mind went to was, Lord, why did you allow this? Because I've been raised up in church, and I was also taught this in certain Bible colleges, that because God is all-powerful, and He is, and because He's sovereign, and He is, that everything ha that happens is His will. But you know what? Uh, just as we've been studying in the Word through the book that David talked about, the Bible does not teach that. Over and over there were things that the Lord doesn't want to happen and yet happen. Why? Because people aren't praying and because people are, are turning. And when you see people uh, that see things changed, it's because they are in persistent prayer. I mean, they are going at it. The Bible talks about the spiritual warfare that, that goes on throughout it. You've got Daniel praying, and you've got uh, the demonic going against the heavenly forces. And it is us that fights the battle through prayer. And so one of the things that I realized through a prayer of Chris is that I really believe it was the enemy that just did not want me here this morning because what it looked like is that it looked like I was going to have to stay and I wasn't going to be able to come back um, until the next day. And the crazy thing is, is that I was just this week, I was telling people that same thing, but I, I wasn't seeing it in my own life. And the reason is because, as David said, we were praying and believe me, I was praying, Lord, get me to that plane. But you know what? When, it, when you're talking about spiritual forces, I mean, the Lord's just showing me, I guess, that we've really got to dig in. I want to share with you a little bit this morning about what's going on with this ministry, because if you are giving to this church, you're a part of this ministry, and you may not realize that. We as a church give $300 a month towards this Bible school that I was teaching in Guatemala. What this Bible school does is that we bring in native pastors, pastors from mountain villages and so on that, you know, preach in churches that literally don't have walls, okay? They're blessed if they've, uh, if they've got a roof. And so we bring these pastors and Christian leaders in, and what we do is we, we teach them about God's Word. Because the thing that they have, as David was talking about, is they have extreme faith. They have childlike faith because they have nothing else. They don't have our doctors to go to. I mean, you know, I was, okay, I also work in law enforcement, you know, and so my eyes are always geared on safety and all that. I mean, it's crazy there. These people ride around on mopeds and dirt bikes and whole families ride on the dirt bike. You'll have a mom on the back with an infant in their arm and the bike's just going in and out of traffic and you're just like, that's crazy. But that's how these people live. And if something happens, again, they don't have great doctors. You know what they have? They have Jesus. And I'm telling you, they have seen Jesus come through in powerful ways. And I think that one of the reasons that the Lord has us in this ministry is so that we can share what we know of the Word so that they can understand more about God and who He is and what He expects of them. But for us, it's to learn what faith is. You know, in this class alone, there was one girl who was injured prior to the class, and uh, she was able to see a doctor. And the doctor told her, listen, you need, you need to stay put. You need to n be immobile. Don't go anywhere. She said, I'm going. Because she did not want to miss out on blessings that the Lord would give her. 
There was another man that was there. Second day we're there, he gets a phone call. His grandchild died. Now, any of us would be like, I'm out of here. I mean, that's it. No, he stayed. You're like, what? No, he stayed. You know why he stayed? Because there was nothing more he could do about his grandchild. His grandchild was gone. But he wanted to seek the Lord. There were stories of this men there. Uh, one man, just, just to give you two stories of one man. One man, uh, he, part of what he does is evangelism, and he was part of an evangelism team. And uh, there was 12 of them, and they're riding in the back of a truck. For those of you who did the feeding center thing, <laughs> they're riding in the back of a truck, and they're going through the mountains. Well, guess what? The brakes go out in the truck as they're coming down the mountain. The truck wrecks, goes off the mountain, and this man gets his back broken two places. They're able to get him to a hospital, and the hospital looks and says, no way, we are not touching that. And so they didn't. And so he just laid there. Well, you know what? God healed him. Broke his back in two places. They didn't want to touch it. God healed him. And I'm sitting there watching him walk around and what he's doing, and I'm just like... Lord, I need that kind of faith. Well, you know what? It doesn't stop there. You know why he trusted in the Lord to heal him? Because when he was first gave his heart to the Lord, he was actually heavily involved in the Catholic Church, but he just didn't know Jesus. He didn't know Jesus as his Savior. And there was an evangelist in town, and he and his uh, wife were going to the meetings, and finally... Uh, they decided we're giving our heart to Jesus. And that was a big deal there because the entire community is, is Catholic. And just so you know, in Guatemala, Catholic is different. Catholic has a lot of witchcraft in it. It, it has a, a, a lot of the uh, Mayan and so on traditions. And so just a lot of demonic oppression there. And so anyways, him and his wife give their heart to the Lord. They go home and they share it with their family, which is a big deal. And through the process and the stress of that, his wife has a heart attack and dies. She dies. And so the next day, they have a wake for her. They bring the family in. Everybody's speaking. And the van they decide to let the evangelist get up and speak at the end. And so he, just, he really feels the Lord laying something on his heart. <laughs> he feels the Lord saying... You know what? If those daughters of his will give their life to me, I'll raise their mom. Oh, that's crazy. That stuff doesn't happen. Well, it happened. It happened. The next day. We're not talking she's out for a little bit and they made a mistake. The next day, he sees his wife raise. And for those of you who've been to Guatemala, that, that's not an isolated story. This stuff happens. Why? Because they are so dependent upon the Lord. And the thing that I, I just, the Lord's just getting into my heart is that we must seek a dependence on the Lord. We must seek a dependence on the Lord and we must get rid of some of our distractions. Because so many times, you know, we just have so much going on. So, you, you know, and that's part of what, for me being over there, it took away all my crutches. <laughs> I didn't have TV. I didn't have AC. I mean, there are just so many things that I don't realize that I just use as these crutches. And all I have is uh, beans, rice, water, and the Word of God. <laughs> I mean, that's what I got. And it just, I realize at first it's hard. I mean, to be honest, your flesh gets mad. You're like, what am I doing here? I need to, you know. But as you push through and you're like, okay, Lord, you've got me here. I'm going to push through this. The Lord begins to open some things up and you experience an intimacy with him that you had not known because you have so many crutches and so many distractions in your life in this culture that get in our way. So one of the first things the Lord was showing is if we are going to know the power of God, or if we're going to know the intimacy that these people with their childlike faith know, we've got to make an effort and say, I'm getting rid of some of these distractions. I'm not going to be a part of every little thing just because everybody else around me is who's not pursuing God at all. I'm going to draw some boundaries. 
And I'm going to say no to this because if I say yes to this, it's saying no to God in other areas. Now, what that's for you, you have to ask the Lord. You've got to ask the Lord and say, Lord, what, what, what are you telling me? What, what, you know, what, what are you trying to say to me? Now, another thing the Lord was speaking to me about is before I went down there, I felt like the Lord gave me a, a sermon uh, title, if you will, if you'd put that up there, Jackson. Um, and it has to do with, with being a hero. Being a hero means having enemies. And when I hear that, I don't, I don't like it. I'm not a person who fears confrontation, but you know what? I don't like living in a town with a bunch of enemies all around me. Does anybody like that? Do you like going to family gatherings and having enemies? Do you like going to your work and having people who want to tear you down and see you fail? I mean, who's going to raise their hand to that? If you do, you're lying, okay? Nobody likes that. But you know what? We want to be the hero. <laughs> you see a movie that comes out that has anything to do with a hero? It does well. You know why? Because God has put that in our hearts. We, it's part of the image of God that's in us. We want to be a hero. And here's what I mean by a hero. We, we, want, to, we, we want to help save others, if you will. We want to be somebody who brings purpose and light and life into other people's life. Now, I know this is so basic, but one of the things the Lord was showing me is you can't do that without having enemies. You can't. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said that as, as, uh, if you follow me and you follow my ways, as they persecuted me and as they per persecuted the prophets before me, they're going to persecute you. And what that means is they're going to hate you and make your life difficult. This is real. If you step up and decide to be a light, and I'm not talking about being a jerk, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about going around people, telling them how bad they are and going to hell and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about standing up and speaking the truth. This is what God says that we should do. This is what brings life. People are not going to like it because their life doesn't mirror that. Their life is different, and so they're going to dislike you for it. But you know what? I have to make a decision, and you have to make a decision. If I'm going to be the hero, if I'm going to be the person who brings light, I will have enemies. If I'm going to be a person who seeks to make as many people happy as I possibly can, I'm not going to be the hero. Because what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be watering things down. I'm going to not be speaking and I'm going to be trying to make people feel comfortable. You know, some of us don't have that problem a lot, but I, I just I, I think about, OK, what 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 are others around me thinking right now? What, what's going on with this? And, and that can be good if it's given over to the Lord. But you know what? It can also control me because I'm constantly thinking about that. Instead of, and what that comes down to is the fear of man instead of the fear of the Lord. And so while I was over there, one of the classes I teach is the life of David. And as we were going through one of the classes, there was just a section of scripture that the Lord just really highlighted to me. And I believe he wants to share that this morning. If you would uh, look with me at 1 Samuel, I want to look at verse eight, or chapter 18, verses 5 through 11. And uh, in this chapter, David has already killed Goliath and uh, Saul is beginning, Saul's the king. Saul's beginning to give him more responsibility because he is the hero. And so we're going to learn a few things about the hero here. Beginning in verse 5, it says, Whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. Oh man, isn't that great? You're the hero. Everybody likes you. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, with tambourines and lutes. 
I mean, that's awesome. You're the hero, you know. It's like we do in this town. You go off, you win something, and you come back, and people are all along the road, and, you know, you get the sirens and all that. Oh, we love that. We want to live in that. Well, they were also saying as they danced, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They had credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Now, just to give you some context of what's going on here in, in the nation of Israel. First of all, Saul, you know, you see God sending an evil spirit. and You're like, what? What's that about? Well, here's the deal. Saul had some of the attitude that, that I've kind of been brought up with, which is basically that uh, I'm chosen of God and God's just going to take care of me. And I can, you know, just kind of do what I want and he's going to take care of me. And what Saul ended up doing was, instead of seeking God, Saul started seeking what was best for his fame and building his wealth. And as he continued down that road, it cost him the kingship. And instead of turning to the Lord, he started turning more towards witchcraft. He started turning more towards other things other than God. Well, because of that, guess what happened? There was an oppression upon the entire nation. Because Saul is not seeking God. And so God sends David, the hero, who comes in, and David doesn't show up and say, hey, you're doing this wrong, and you're doing this wrong, and you're doing this wrong. David just comes in and says, this is the way to do it. <laughs> this is the way to do it because we are God's people, and God wants us to go this way. So David steps in, he does it, and what happens is, is that it brings freedom to the nation. Well, guess what? If you stand up and be the hero in your family, in your work, in your school, wherever you're at, and you bring freedom to people, you're going to make some people mad. Because it's going to be a reminder to them that they are not submitted to the Lord. They are not bringing that freedom. They are an avenue of oppression. And so they are going to want to stuff you down. That's why they killed Jesus. He was bringing freedom to the people and the, the religious leaders that were supposed to be bringing freedom, they hated it. They had to snuff him out. And so they began doing the same thing to David. But the beauty of it is, is this. God was training David for this from the beginning. Because if you go back and you look at when David was first called, his family, when they had the, the prophet of Israel come into their house, they left him out to be with the sheep because they didn't like him. They, they just, they treated him with contempt. I mean, this is like the president coming to your house. Are you going to leave your kid out playing with the chickens? You're going to bring him in. You know, this is a big deal. Well, they didn't. They left David out. Because they had contempt for him. But you know what? It was part of the plan for God. Because David was raised up not having the love of people, but having the love of God. Because he spent his days out tending sheep, and he drew close to the Lord in those places. And the Lord set it up so that he would bond with him, and he would seek him later in life. If you've gone through things in your life where you felt rejected, listen. Listen. This is not, uh, you know, what God wants for you to feel rejected. But you know what? He may be using it for his glory because he wants to teach you to seek him for intimacy. Don't be looking for, for other people for that intimacy. You're not going to find it. God has put us together. We need one another. But you know what? Ultimately, you need the Lord. And if we learn to lean on the Lord and to desire His approval and not the approval for others, we're set up to be the hero. And the reason is, is because we can then bring light to people 
okay? Not, not in a, again, a, a jerk kind of way, just being mean to people, but we can speak life into people Knowing that some are going to reject us, some are going to hate us, but we can be in a place where we say, you know what, I don't like that, it's not pleasant, but you know what, what I need more than the approval of people is I need the approval of God, and He's called me here to bring freedom to you, so I'm going to be bold, and I'm going to speak about this. And that's exactly what David did. And because of that, the nation didn't just receive him, he ended up out in the caves, he ended up out in the caves because the most powerful person in that nation hated him. And so, so many other people followed him as well. There's an account later after that where he goes down and he literally saves a town that's inside this wall. And after he saves them, I mean, they were going to be raided. They were going to be killed. It was going to be ugly. He saves them. They hear Saul's coming. And you know what? The word says that they were going to turn David over. So David comes in, saves them. They were going to turn him right over. It, I, it's so brutal being the hero, bringing, bringing light. You can't do it if you're only doing it for what others are, are going to give you back because it's not going to happen. You have to look to the Lord for it. But when we begin to get rid of distractions and we begin to say, Lord, you're my portion. Lord, you are the one that I want approval from. You're the one I want intimacy from. I'm going to get rid of some of these other things so that it doesn't distract me. We are set up not only for closeness with the Lord, but to be a hero and to bring light. Here's the thing. Not only us, but we as a nation, we need this light. We need it. But you know what? It's not going to happen unless some of us start standing up in whatever domain we're at and just start speaking truth. Not in a jerk way, but just speaking truth. And when you do it, people are going to hate you for it. That, that's what's going to happen. But as you do it, you have the ability to bring light and life to people. Because we have an entire culture in our nation that is dying with distractions. I mean, it's in the church because we don't, we don't know what it is to walk in closeness with the Lord because we're so, and, and our distractions have so much of our heart that, that we continue to put people in leadership that, that, that don't pursue the Lord. You know, I, I see on Facebook some of my Christian friends are like, man, I wish we had better choices, you know, for president or whatever. We do have better choices, but we don't want them. If you have somebody who follows the Lord, they will be rejected. So it's not about the leaders, it's about our culture. Well, you know what? You and I can change our culture. Not over the whole U.S., but you know what? Nobody in Ohio can change this culture right here. You and I can change it. You and I can change it when we begin to stand up and just to speak truth, to speak about the Lord, to quit allowing people to shut us up. I said this last time, but I'm going to say it again. You know, we keep hearing about this thing, separation of church and state. Well, it's true. And the whole point of it was that the government didn't control the church. And just like the enemy, they've spun it as if, you know, the, the government's supposed to reject God. No, it's the exact opposite. So we need to stand up and speak the truth and say, no, we're not, we're not supposed to keep God out of everything else. Baloney, you're not supposed to control the church and we're not going to allow it. We're going to stand up and we're going to speak about Jesus wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and you're not going to silence us. Is it going to come with consequences? Yes, it is. It is, but the reward is great. I want to look at that passage I was talking about in Matthew 5 um, concerning the, the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus set, talks about this reward. Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's just it. People are going to lie about you, okay? When you speak truth, people are going to lie about you. Now, if you just go along with them and you don't try to bring in any light and you try to make them feel good about rejecting God and pursuing idols, 
and they're going to be slapping you on the back, inviting you to their, you know, cookouts. You, you're going to be good. But if you start speaking truth, they're going to start making up evil about you. Okay? You, you got to decide. Because here's what he says next. He says, rejoice and be glad. What? Why would I do that? Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Great is your reward in heaven. This life is but a blink. I mean, I know I look young to some of you, but, you know, I should be like 20. I should be like half my age. Life is but a blink. I mean, Montana was the age of Collins yesterday. Most of you remember this. It's a blink. Do not sacrifice eternity for some stupid distractions here on earth. Get rid of them. Stand up and begin to just speak truth. Speak truth, church. Jesus, we love you. We love your ways. And we just ask, Lord, that you would give us boldness through your spirit. Show each one of us individually, Lord, some distractions that are going on right now. Lord, bring that to our heart. Give us some boldness to say no, Lord, to draw some boundaries where you're calling us to draw boundaries. Lord, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.